Hi, if you've been following along with my landscape tutorial series and watched part four of that series where I introduced you to Unreal material layers uh, to use for landscape materials, then you may have stumbled across a portion of the video that didn't make much sense when I started talking about detailed texturing and how to blend macro and detailed textures in Unreal to avoid the appearance of tiling and to generally just make the landscape look good at all distances. And the reason you might have stumbled over it is because when I was editing that video, I mistakenly cut out the portion where I actually implemented the solution for detailed texturing. So in addition to fixing that video, uh, which is now uploaded, uh, it's over an hour long, so sorry about that, I decided I would also create a separate kind of add-on video which discusses detailed texturing in a bit more depth and looks at more than just the one method I outlined in the other video. So in this video, we're going to be addressing the three different methods, three methods that I know of that you can use to implement uh, in Unreal uh, to get rid of the appearance of tiling and to blend textures that look good for different distances. So I'm sure that if any of you have already dabbled with terrains inside of Unreal, then what I'm looking at right now on my screen is going to be familiar, very familiar to you. We're looking at a big uh, open portion of terrain that I haven't yet begun sculpting. Uh, I haven't imported any height map information yet and there's no layers. Uh, I've just set up a very basic starter material which applies grass to the landscape. And as you can see, we've got some very, very clear tiling going on. That is this visual artifact where you can see the repetition uh, of the same texture as it as it covers, stretches across the whole landscape like so, uh, which, which is really unattractive. Uh, it can be mitigated somewhat once you have many other textures that you're blending in different places, the appearance will be reduced uh, and also you could choose a texture that covered a larger area and therefore the tiling would become less, or you could try and choose a really bland texture, uh, a texture that doesn't have any sort of noticeable features in it. Because you can see in this one that I've chosen, uh, the tailing is even more noticeable because we have this kind of lumpy area that repeats and it, and it makes it even more apparent. So if the texture itself was more generic, for example, if it was very much focused on these kinds of areas here and that was tiling, it would probably be less noticeable tiling again. However, this isn't the full solution. Uh, so what we usually do, what we like to do is blend another texture on top of this detail texture uh, so that as you, as the terrain ex extends further into the distance, uh, we kind of lose that repetition um, as, as the larger scale texture becomes the more dominant one. So does Unreal have support for detail texturing built into the material editor out of the box? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're going to look at a function, uh, one method that you can implement called uh, the detail texture function. Uh, so you can see here that in the material editor, I'm just using this function here, detail texturing, which comes as stock with Unreal. You can find it by just typing detail texturing in, in the search bar there. And this just gives you a bunch of inputs, uh, diffuse, normal, detail, diffuse, detail, normal, and then controls for the intensity and the scaling of the detail texture. So I'm just going to close that away again there. And we're going to apply that to the landscape in place of the detail only that we've got here. So, okay, straight away, we can see that that looks pretty different. And what exactly is different about it? Well, it's completely changed color. And uh, we can't actually really see the details of that uh, detail diffuse that we've got in there. So what are we seeing? Well, we're pretty much just seeing the macro texture. So I'm just gonna put that on for a second and show the macro and show what that would look like. And you can see here what we've got, this is, uh, this is a texture that I, I extracted from Google Maps um, of a field. Uh, so it's intended to look good from a sort of aerial perspective. And um, you can see that we're going really close. It's just a splodgy mess. There's no detail whatsoever. So what this detail texturing node is doing is it's kind of quite naively just combining those two uh, together. So you see, we're going really close. Uh, you can actually see that there is this detail texture going on. Um, we've got all of that information. We've got the normals even. If I just switch to color only, you can see we are still getting that detail in there, but it's really, really faint. Um, you're getting the detail, none of the color from the detail texture is coming through. So it looks sort of looks a bit jarring and unnatural, um, but it does do the job of hiding that tiling to some degree. Now, 
For some cases, this might be useful. So for example, if you have a concrete wall and you want to get some sort of micro details in there, um, or I don't know, some kind of rocky surface with little cracks and whatnot, where the actual base color of the detail texture isn't all that important. However, for a large, expansive and kind of varied uh, prop, I don't know if it's a prop environment, like a landscape, uh, it's not going to work all too well. So one of the, uh, there's, there's thankfully another couple of methods, and I'm going to go to the most common one next, or the most commonly used one, the one which I see sort of shown in most tutorials, most guides, and most, uh, I don't know, uh, breakdowns, uh, and that is to use distance-based blending. So I'm just going to get that up, um, and we're going to jump inside of the distance blend material here. And the way that the distance blending works is you define the macro texture, you define the detail textures, and then you do a camera distance-based fall-off. So you measure the distance from the camera to the position in the world, uh, and then you do a fall-off, like a gradient, um, which blends between those two sets of textures using lerps or using a blend material attributes, which I'll just get fine here. So you can treat a blend, a blend material attributes much like a lerp. It will just blend a whole material at once. So this is a, another way to do it, and it's perfectly valid. So I'll show you what that looks like. I'm going to go over, get the distance blend, and apply that to the landscape. And you can see that's actually looking better. I, I think most people will agree. Um, it depends what you're going for. But the nice thing about this is that you get that natural color of the of the detail texture coming through uh, when you're up close. So it looks a whole lot more natural and realistic. And when you're far away, you get that nice uh, macro texture. However, there's a downside to this approach, which which I'll show you now. So if we start to sort of move the camera in very slowly, Tell me, you're, you're going to kind of note down the point at which you start to see the texture changing. And if we do that really fast, you're going to see that the change can be quite abrupt. And this is a more forgiving angle, but if we bring the camera down even lower and look out here, you can quite clearly see, if I just get this pen up again, you can see that we've got the detail texture here and it's showing pure, pretty much pure detail texture. And then you've got pretty much pure, uh, pretty much pure um, macro texture at this distance. And you get this kind of like, transparent fall off from the far distance into the near field. And when you're static, this looks a little bit odd, but the real problem is when you start moving around, you're going to, I'll try and slow the camera down a little bit, but you, the real problem is when you slow down, you, I mean, perhaps you're very accustomed to seeing this because it is, it's, it's, it's used in a lot of cases uh, and it's, and it's what is uh, recommended by a lot of YouTube videos and tutorials, but if you're looking for that fall off, you can definitely notice when the transition starts to happen. And once you start to notice this, it can feel quite unnatural. The reason for that is because it's not what happens in real life. You 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 obviously don't have uh, a a one one set of information up close and one set of information far away. The information is always there in the real world. It's just the macro features become more noticeable as you get further away, as those fine details become smaller and smaller and less significant to the overall picture. So this method kind of abuses that fact and sort of we accept it because it, it, it it's sort of synonymous. It kind of uh, creates that same feeling, but it's, but the detail is actually disappearing. Another thing to note about this method is that when you're right up close to the landscape, the ground here doesn't take any of that color information from the macro textures. So depending on the distance that you set, and you can change the distance by going into the material and driving this fall off distance parameter. So if we increase that to 1000, like so, then you're gonna start noticing that that tiling becomes way more noticeable again. And we have this very uniform color everywhere. Now you might introduce a noise map to add some variation to the color of the detail texture. But by that point, you're introducing another texture and you're uh, kind of, requiring extra controls and sacrificing simplicity a little bit. So I'm not too much of a fan of this method and I spent quite a lot of time exploring different solutions and came across one that I was immediately a fan of. And I'm just gonna bring up, uh, I'm gonna bring up the article where I first heard about it. So I discovered this uh, World of Tanks uh, blog on ATLV. Uh, I think it must've been close to six, five, five, I don't know how many years ago it came out, maybe four or five years ago. And as I was skimming through it, it was absolutely jam packed with useful and great information about how to make large scale terrains and foliage and optimization and background terrains and all of that. And it's sort of a lot of, I took a lot of inspiration from this blog in my, in my own workflow. 
But the bit that stuck out for me in particular was this little uh, diagram here, if I just open that, which is an algorithm to describe how do you blend together uh, near field macro and global textures. And what they were trying to achieve uh, or what I should yeah, what they were trying to achieve was they were trying to achieve consistency in the textures that are displayed. So the the detail textures when you're up close will take in the color of the macro and the global map. Uh, and when you go far, far away, you don't actually make the detail map disappear. Uh, it just like in the real world becomes less visually significant when you introduce those those larger features. So they were trying to solve this problem where you keep that consistency and you don't have to rely on kind of a more hacky approach. So I implemented this in Unreal, or at least I implemented an approach that was inspired by it. And I'm going to set that up right now. And I call that the bias blend method. Um, it was originally designed by this artist, uh, Karinya Trichik. I hope that I'm not murdering that name, although I'm sure I am. So she definitely deserves credit for coming up with the original implementation uh, in World of Tanks there. And I've basically just copied that and I've created it inside of Unreal. And you can see what happens here, if we move the camera around a little bit, is we get the true color or close to it of the macro texture when you're far away, but actually the detail texture is still there. And at this point, it just looks like noise, but you can't see any of that tiling. So it's really effectively uh, kind of blending those two different uh, texture sets together. And the nicest part of this, I think, is as you zoom in closer and closer to the terrain, there's no point at which the, that fake distance-based blend happens. It's always there and your details just become more important to you as a viewer the closer you get. Not only that, when you are up close, finally, you see that that macro texture actually influences the color of that base texture on the ground, which is probably the nicest part of this altogether. Now, you can imagine that if you were to implement a few different layers, you have rock, you have sand and dirt, and you start to kind of merge all of these different aspects into a real terrain, you're going to end up with something that holds up really, really well at a distance uh, and something which holds up really, really well up close. And you're not really sacrificing anything, or at least you are sacrificing something, which I'll get to in a minute, but it's 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 probably visually, uh, at least in my opinion, the the best result that you can, you can get without going completely overboard. Um, so how do we set this up? Well, I'm going to jump inside the bias blend material here. And you can see it doesn't really look any more complex than the other ones that we've been looking at. Um, where does the magic happen? Well, it happens up in this detail color blending section. So what we've got is we've got our macro texture here, which is the sort of distant terrain. And we're just plumbing that into this, which could be broken into a function effectively, this part here. And you see that we've got three of these little nodes here, two texture samples and one texture object. So the texture object here is the detail texture. And then we actually, we're sampling it twice. And why are we sampling it twice? Well, it's because we need to find the average color of the texture. And that's what we're doing down here in this texture sample. In this texture sample, you have to make sure in the settings that you've set the MIP value mode to MIP bias. So MIPs are essentially lower resolution versions of the same texture. And I'm MIP biasing it all the way up to nine. So we're essentially choosing a very, very blurry version of that texture. We're then subtracting that blurry version of that texture from the diffuse macro. And then finally, we're adding back in that sharp map. And that's it. So if we have a look back inside of the viewport now, you'll find that if we go and play with that bias result and turn, if we say, let's put that bias on zero, that completely removes, apart from the normal maps, we've completely lost the detail texture there. And if we start to write, raise that value up to three, four, five, six, seven, you can see we have the ability to determine how much the detail texture influences the color of the terrain. So this is really nice. Not only does it actually give you kind of a better base to work from in the first place, um, it also allows you to control and art direct the scene more than either of the other two approaches without having to rely on just tinting things. So of course there is a downside and the downside is that it's costing you an extra texture sample here. So whereas with the other two methods, you only have one texture sample for the detail color, with this one, in order to use the bias method, you have to use an additional texture sample. This might be acceptable depending on your use case. I find that typically it is acceptable and within budget to use this approach. Uh, and it's always my preferred method, uh, but your mileage may vary depending on the project. If you want to sacrifice a little bit of ease of a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of ease of use, there is another, another way you can do this, which is you can just throw in a vector. You can call that vector average color. And then you can go into the color picker here and you can pick the color of the texture sample. 
Oh, that didn't work. Oh, it did work. And then you plug that in to be subtracted instead and cut out this additional sample. And you can see that those are exactly the same color. So if I apply this result now, you can see it looks exactly the same. What we lose is the ability to change our textures on the fly because every single time we'd have to come in and set this average color manually again. And we also lose the ability to control the art direction of the texture blending a little bit. So if if you can, and I generally do prefer this, I just stick with that texture there using the MIP sampled version of the texture. And uh, and I'm really happy with, with how that works out. So uh, I hope that you find this useful. Um, and let me know in the comments what you think. If you have any other methods that you can that you use or that you know of for blending in detail to macro textures, let me know which method is your favorite. I'm really curious to hear what people think. Uh, and remember uh, to credit uh, remember to credit Karina um, if you do use this material. In fact, I should probably put a little note in here somewhere saying um, thanks for coming up with it because it's it's great and it's the way that I always use now. So. That's it. Um, I'll be releasing more content shortly and thanks for your time. Bye.